In-depth journalism in the Memphis community, The Daily Memphian is of Memphis, not just in Memphis, and seeks to tell the stories of this city. TheDailyMemphian.com. Truth in place. I want to welcome everybody to the Daily Memphian Tigers podcast with Greg Gaston. And I want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays to you. We got a full slate today, a very, very busy show. I'll be joined by Tim Buckley, Daily Memphian Deputy Sports Editor and Senior Writer. We'll talk Tigers basketball with Parth Upajai, the Tigers basketball beat writer. And then we'll get to Tigers football with Frank Bonner, the Tigers football beat writer, of course, for the Daily Memphian. Welcome aboard. Thanks for being with us. Gentlemen, what a run for the University of Memphis. I know, Parth, you have not been here for that long, but in his sixth year now with the head coach of the Tigers, Penny Hardaway, this certainly has to be their best run. Now, they did have an NCAA tournament win right. and then lost in the second round, but to be able to beat back-to-back-to-back to back to back ranked opponents, first time ever in regular season Memphis basketball history, tells you this team right now is clicking on all cylinders. No, for sure, and it seems like you know, Penny's had success, obviously, in his six years. You know, they turned it around in what uh, that 21, 22 season where they they went on that run and, you know, almost had Gonzaga right in that first round or second round, rather, of the NCAA tournament. But this seems like the way things are trending now, their first, you know, kind of uh, rise back to national prominence. Right. Quite frankly, since the John Calipari, you know, days back in, you know, 08, 09, 07, um, that that stretch there. So, yeah, definitely. Um, these three games have been, you know, among the highlights of Penny's tenure here. It's still early, Tim, but there are people equating it to Calipari's magical run. And his sixth year is when he started to get it really going for Memphis. And this is year number six for Penny Hardaway. Can you find a parallel between the two? Uh, or for us old people, a parallel to uh, Keith Lee days. Wow. Tell me about that. <laughs> oh, I mean, they were absolutely incredible. No, but I mean, was it a six-year run for Dana before he got it Well, going? not. I don't know if it was quite that long, but but during the whole Keith Lee era, mm-hmm. that was an incredible program. And um, it just in terms of, of maybe more than anything, the feel of it's December and you're sensing that, to use Penny's words, special. There, there could be something special brewing. Um, and that's code for Final Four. Wow, I, I called the game. I called the game wow. on Saturday against Clemson, and uh, enjoyed having a big time game that I was able to call. It's been a while, but on Tuesday night, I got a chance to just kick back in the stands and watch it, basically as just a fan. Yep. And as Tim was alluding to, the atmosphere we have not seen that in a while. We saw it Saturday. Great crowd for a Tuesday night, a weekday game. And, of course, when you're playing Clemson and Virginia, as opposed to some of the smaller D1 right, schools, right. it's going to bring out those people. But it had that electricity that we haven't seen in a while. No, for sure. I mean, I don't think anything's matched so far, at least in my opinion. Uh, last year's finale, regular season finale against Houston, that place was buzzing. The upper level was packed. Like, it was just, um, it was electric, right? Like, against Houston. Um, but these past two, you know, have certainly been in the top five of the atmospheres I've covered here on this beat, you know, in the past year and a half that I've been here. Um, but to see it, I think the the most exciting thing is to see it consistently, you know, back to back games, obviously, as you said, top 25 opponents. So, you know, not terribly hard to get people in the building, but, um, you know, there's definitely a buzz about this team and, and in this city and to see it kind of tangibly represent itself in the building last night was, was special. You alluded to the Keith Lee days, of course, back in the day, you didn't have all these streaming services and different ways to watch games and you usually had to go to the game, Tim, to, to watch the darn game. It wasn't on every game wasn't on television or some way that you could watch it streaming wise. So you were there. Did you get that kind of feeling as well that yeah, they're back to playing these big time games? They played big time opponents and they won those two games that it's kind of shades of the past. Yeah, it was well, I mean, if you're if you're going all the way back, the way the Mid South Coliseum Rocked. I don't know if you've ever. I never read, had. Yeah, never had the chance. It was just because of the way that it was built and, and the size of it and and the way the noise bounced off the roof in that place. Right. That thing was crazy. Um, I think the atmosphere thought the atmosphere was terrific for the for the Clemson game, but it could have been better. I know that's not a popular opinion, but 
Um, I thought I thought it was more raucous for the the Houston game last season, even than the the Clemson game. Um, if you looked in the upper bowl, there was a lot of empty seats in the mm-hmm. in the upper half of the upper bowl. Um, but with all that said, I mean it was it was a really nice college college basketball atmosphere. Um, when everything came together, decent weather, um, a Saturday, no football really getting in the way nationally ranked team in town. Uh, it was terrific. Tougher draw when you're talking about 6 PM on a, on a Tuesday night, um, with John Morant also, you know, playing on TV and his, in his debut, even though it was two nationally ranked teams for the first time since what part 2014. Yep. Um, yep. so, um, you know, not quite as much of the buzz on, on Tuesday as on Saturday. The fact that it was a blowout game too, you know, maybe knocked mm-hmm. it a smidge. But both of them were absolutely just terrific to to witness. I mean, it was it's it's fun when it's when it's like that. By the way, for the record, I've been here long enough to have covered events at the Mid South Coliseum, but I can't recall a River Kings game where the roof almost came off. It just wasn't the same as Tim alludes to the <laughs> days of, of Memphis basketball. But I still got the River Kings cap somewhere. I got a River I'm Kings sorry, R- River Hockey Kings? Stick. Yeah, we yeah, had a minor uh, league professional that? hockey that? league team. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, It was minor league hockey. We yeah. had it right okay. here at the Mid-South Coliseum. They yeah. moved down I, to I South I have no Haven. idea. I should yeah. probably know that. Yeah. Wow. The, co- the coach was one of the Hanson brothers. At one time. From the movie Slapshot. So you got to explain part Slapshot part now. Never part. seen. <laughs> no, see, we got to do a lot of You looked at my face and you hadn't seen the movie. Yeah, I have no idea what you're talking about. If you have not seen Slapshot, you have not seen the greatest movie. You'll enjoy it. Perhaps. It's a hockey movie. It's a hockey movie. Paul Newman. See, now we got to explain who Paul Newman is. We try to educate as well as entertain here on this program. All right, getting back to the Tigers. Saturday, they win over Clemson 79-77 in a game in which they shoot 4 of 26 from beyond the arc. It's hard to believe that you can shoot that poorly, 15%, and win that basketball game. But that's the game I thought if they were going to lose one of these two, that would be it. I had all the confidence in the world they were going to come back Tuesday and win. I did not think it was going to be a blowout win. They won 77-54. Which of the two was more impressive to you? Man, that's a tough question. Um, because after the Clemson win, you're like, you know, how can they possibly top this right against Virginia, who you know plays this super stout brand of defense, and you know, is like watching paint dry on offense, that kind of thing. <laughs> but man, like I think the Virginia Virginia win to to blow that team out the way they did to win by 23, um, to force the Cavaliers into 18 turnovers. The Cavaliers have not had 18 turnovers in a game since 2020, January 15th, 2020 against Florida State is the last time they turned the ball over that much. There was a guy, um, I'm blanking on the guy's name, and I, I apologize to him if he's if he's listening, but um, in the media room yesterday who, you know, has covered Virginia basketball since the late 90s, I believe. So I turned to him before Tony Bennett came out, and I, and I said, you know, when's the last time a Virginia team's looked, you know, this disorganized, discombobulated, whatever you want to call it? And he had to rack his brain, and he couldn't recall a time. So that just kind of shows you um, how, how unique and, and special what Penny Hardaway's defense did last night was. Do you agree with Parth that that was the more impressive win? It was the blow. It's, it was the biggest of the two as far as blowout is concerned. It's like yeah. asking me which one of my two kids is the favorite. Oh wait, <laughs> oh wait, I don't have kids. Which one of my two dogs? Oh wait, I don't have dogs. Which one of my Nieces, two nephews, cats? There you go. Plants, plants. Oh well, I used to have plants. Are they that equal? Um, yeah. For I, I, I think they're. I think they're more equal because. One of them proved that you can get it done in a close game against a really good team. While not playing your best. And the other yeah, while while not being able to hit the broadside of a barn. <laughs> and and the other one that um that you can push the gas pedal against a really good team um and get a glimpse of what they're capable of when everything goes right. Yeah, Penny said, and I'm not paraphrasing here, but we basically have to dictate pace. It was games with contrasting style, or teams with contrasting style. Both of the opponents, yes, Yes, absolutely. But really, especially Virginia, as you alluded to, the slowdown pace as they try to use the entire shot clock. They're not a team that runs up and down. So he wanted to dictate pace. Not the easiest thing to do against a Tony Bennett coach team. They dictated pace. They controlled that game from the outset. That is a great coaching job. 
Absolutely. They sped the thing up from from really the get-go. You know, they jumped out to that 13-1, and one, I believe, lead it was. Right. Less than four minutes in. Um, Virginia obviously settled down, stopped turning the ball over. But even then, you know, Memphis was able to kind of ramp up the pressure yet again, you know, late in that first half and and build that, what, six-point lead at the break. Um, so I thought, you know, like we said, that more than anything was spectacular, you know, going up against Virginia and saying, no, we're going to play our style of basketball. I thought there were... Earlier in the season, defensive lapses, especially around the perimeter. Yes, absolutely. They have shored up those problems the last couple of games. And what they did in that Clemson game, specifically down the stretch, getting the shot clock violation, guys are all over the floor, yeah. and defensive lockdown in this particular game as well. It's been tremendous. Yeah, guys guys sacrificing their bodies, and that's, that's a good sign in December. It really is. All right, you make the call. Last five seasons of Dana Kirk – Sweet 16, Sweet 16, Sweet 16, Final Four, second round. His last five. His last five of his seven. So how many years did he coach Three total? Metro Conference Championships, f- seven with Memphis State. So seven, wow. What did he do those first two years? Uh, 13 and 14 both years. Okay. So he turned it around real quick. Yeah. A couple of years he turned so it around 24 and five. A little bit longer, eight. right, for Cal. Yeah. And now with Penny – Again, just one tournament win in five years, but this is the year that he can shut up a lot of people. And we already see that coaching, as I mentioned, just going toe-to-toe with a tactician like Tony Bennett. Now, how much has Rick Stansbury helped, in your opinion, Parth? Yeah, it's hard to say. Um, and obviously, don't want to take any credit away from Penny. Sure. Because he's the one who made that hire, and he's the one who and organized Rick would say the staff, same and thing. so on and yeah. so forth. And Rick would say the same thing. But I think offensively, you see a lot more structure, right? Like you see plays, you know, being run versus kind of freestyling it. Um, some of these inbounds plays have been phenomenal. Mm-hmm. There was there was one. The one to Caleb Mills? That, mm-hmm. Exactly. I can't remember when it happened in the game, but just, you know, for Caleb to kind of get freed up the way he did and get an easy layup off a, of an inbounds underneath their own basket. And was, some of their cool, inbounds have been terrible. Yeah, it has been up and down. <laughs> There's been times where they've passed it to the corner and times. Multiple times. Multiple yes, times. Yes, yes. But that's when, <laughs> when, that's when teams pressure Memphis. Virginia wasn't pressuring Memphis, so they were able to do more things. But I, I agree with Tim. We've seen a lot. Hopefully they sure that up because we've seen that exposed. That wasn't the type of team, Virginia, that does that type of stuff. But we saw the rebounding, as we talked about, improve over the last couple of games. And, and hopefully they're working on that as well. One other thing when you mentioned Stansberry, like, I think those guys are listening to him. Um, but uh, Malcolm Dandridge last night dropped his name with the reference to oh, something that that Rick Stansberry says to him about, you know, you're, you're not going to outmatch. I'm paraphrasing. You're not going to outmatch the talent, but um, you got to. Uh, but if you add in the effort and the heart, um, this team this team has something. You got to and like he he referenced Stansberry saying that. Now maybe it was the influence of the first three games in the in their interim capacity or whatever. Sometimes when there's two two really loud voices on the bench in very different styles, um guys listen to one, tune out the other. I think they buy into Benny, Penny's approach, which is very different than Stansberry's, but I think they buy into Stansberry's too. Well, let's make it clear. There's one voice on the bench, and that's Penny Hardaway. But in practice and in the build-up no, to the I, game. I, I quibble with that. No, Stansbury's in. He, Stansbury's, Stansbury's up. He's in guys' ears. Okay, that. I agree with that. Yeah. But he's not. I don't think he's going to Penny when Penny makes a call and say, no, we need to change that. He'll no, talk to him during a timeout. That's not his personality, no, from what yeah. I understand. He'll talk to him during a right. timeout yeah, at absolutely, halftime, absolutely. I'm sure. But once the decision is made, that's Penny's. That's the yeah, point I was making. Yeah. But you're right. He gets in. To talking to the players gets in their ear, but really, we're I think it it shines in practice, we're, and we're not privy to that all the time. Where that's how he helps with his experience. Take you know, m- make no bones about it. Penny Hardaway's improved drastically as a head coach, but to have Rick Stansbury by his side, and when he eventually went to veteran coaches like Frank Haith, that did not hurt with Frank Haith's defensive ability as a coach strategist. We saw how well they played defensively last year, but certainly Penny has learned an awful lot. He's done an awful lot as a player, and it's all coming to fruition. And then, of course, we talked about him last week. The accolades just keep pouring in and should be pouring in for David Jones. There is no question there are are numerous guys who can beat you. But there is 
one go-to guy. He's special, and man. that's David Jones. He's so special. Twenty-six points. The you know the only player with more than eleven points for Memphis last night. Eight of fifteen. So super efficient again from the floor. Two of three from from three. He's playing at an all-American level, man. If, if this is sustained, like there's no doubt he'll be you know either a second or third team at least all-American. This is this is what we're seeing. And Timmy gets to the free throw line. He makes free throws. Absolutely does that. Absolutely can score. He knocked down that early three yesterday, which uh, uh, I think kind of helped set the tone. Now, if he can start to deliver quotes like he delivers buckets, <laughs> then you're talking all American. He's got some. He's got some colorful quotes, man. He's funny. He's, he's, he's he, quiet. He'll 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 drop in little one liners or make little facial. You think he's quiet? Gestures. Yeah. I, I disagree. I disagree. He's he's funny. He's colorful. He's cracking jokes. Did I tell you this story? I may have said it on one of our previous podcasts. I'm doing a game. It was the Alabama State game. I think I did Jackson State, then Alabama State, and now I've done a Clemson game. So I've done three of their, what, four home games? I have my bottle of water over there. Before the game, they're doing, they're running up and down, like from side to side. He comes over and he undoes the top of the water bottle. I'm demonstrating that, by the way, to the guys here. And he hands it to me with a big smile on his face. And I look at him like, did you want to take a sip? He goes, no, no, it's for you. (laughs) <laughs> just you know, out of the blood of the blue. He, he's something. I'll tell you, after the Texas A&M game, kind of similar type of story. Um, you know, Jason Munz from the Commercial Appeal and I are talking to to him in the hallway, you know, outside the visitor's locker room at Texas A&M. And, you know, we're asking him questions. We're getting ready to start the interview. And I think Jason had, you know, was asking the first question. He said, no, 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 stop, 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 stop. He looks at me and says, you know, I really like your outfit. So like, just, <laughs> just, just, just stuff like that, man. Well, he's what, goofy. What I want to know is why did you demonstrate the water scene with your pinky out like you're drinking a cup of tea? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I thought it was this finger that's out. Well, it was, it was both. It, it was both, yeah, actually. It's yeah. hard for me to control those two Fair fingers. Fair enough. Continue. That's from an old golfing accident, which I will not talk about here on the podcast. Carry on. All right. So now, 19, no, make it 20 games remain in the regular season. So it's a long way to go. Yep. 20 games. They haven't even started conference play. 20 games. I was talking about this today, Tuesday, on my radio show. I expect that Memphis, Tim, will be favored in the next 19 games and that 20th game to end the regular season is the away game in Boca against Florida Atlantic, where depending on what Florida Atlantic does, Memphis still could be a favorite in that one. But if there's the only one I could see where they would not be the favorite would be at Florida Atlantic. Do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, assuming that catastrophe doesn't strike. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All bets are off if something like that happens. Parth? Yeah, to your point, um, I personally think so, absolutely. But even the metrics think so. I'm looking at Ken Palm right now. Every single game, like you just said, except for the regular season finale in, at Boca, in Boca Raton, rather, on March 9th, Memphis is favored in. So the computers give them a chance of, you know, what is that, going, I guess there's 21 games left, right? So, well, no, 20 games, I'm 20 sorry. 20 games so, left. So, so 19 and one rest of the way, that's, I mean, that's, that's amazing. I will drop another name, Jerry Palm, who comes on weekly on my radio show. I asked him a scenario where Memphis loses one to Florida Atlantic and loses another in the conference. Okay. 16 so and two. Okay. 16 and two in conference. Beat Vanderbilt this Saturday. Beat Austin P on the 30th. That would make them 27 and four. Correct? Co- correct. Yeah. Two losses in conference. Two losses out of conference. I said, yeah. what is what is their ceiling seating wise for the NCAA tournament? He said they won't get a one because there's too many teams that are established right now percent. as ones. He said their ceiling is a two seed. I heard him say that on your show. I was listening this morning. So. Man, that's for, from a guy who knows these things as well as anybody else. That's that's high praise, and that's certainly you know got to be music to the ears of, of Penny Hardaway and that staff. Which shows you again why he schedules the way he schedules, and will continue to try to schedule this way because you have to make up games for what you don't get in the conference. You do. It's a risky proposition. I it mean, is. when when he, when he made that schedule, not only did he not know how good they would be, he, like he didn't know who half his guys <laughs> didn't would have be. a team. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and <laughs> like you're so you're rolling the dice that everything's going to fall into place for you in recruiting. That they're going to come together, um, but I don't think in your wildest imagination you do you dream knocking off three straight nationally ranked teams when you when you built that schedule. I mean, he was he was building it for who they're playing against, not. It, not he he was building it not for what they're going to do against who they were playing against but more for who they were playing against and then mm-hmm. the rest is 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 gravy or as they say in louisiana lanyap 
Lamyat? Lanyap. Told you we learn a little bit on the show, right? <laughs> yeah. We entertain, but we learn a little bit. So let me ask you this. If, if, if Penny doesn't know his roster from year to year, which is probably going to be the case because he'll continue to go after these portal guys. Sure. Um, he's going to continue to schedule. So I think it's going to be the same scenario year in and year out where he puts together this rugged schedule, goes out and gets the players. And what is the motto around here? In Penny, we trust. That's you what just they say. Trust him. That's what they say. And look, he has to. This conference is awful. Like, I don't know how else to say it. This conference is trash. You know, it's it's ranked the ninth best conference, according to the metrics. That's behind, you know, all five power five leagues, the Big East, the Mountain West, the Atlantic 10. Like, all these leagues have surpassed the AAC because of the teams that they have. Um, how does Parth really feel? Yeah, by the way, <laughs> by the way, the phone just rang. Outgoing Commissioner Michael Resco is on the phone, wants to talk to you right now, Parth. Man, I love Mike. He's, you're he's called awesome. the principal's he's office. Awesome. No, but you're right. This is a bad conference. Like, how else do you say it? There's no opportunities for for needle moving wins, and there's plenty of opportunities for bad losses. Like if you, you know, mess around and lose to a, I'm looking at it right now to a Charlotte in South Florida Temple. Like the list goes on and on about the kind of landmines that are going to be you know on the table from January 4th when they play at Tulsa all the way to the end. And Tim, you've covered basketball for a long time, not just here in Memphis, all around the country in Louisiana, and you know when it's a really really good team like an LSU goes into whatever plays a smaller team. Those smaller schools are ready to go in that particular yeah. night. And if you're not ready to go, that's an L. Yep, target on your back. Cliché, true. Um, the reason they're clichés. Right. And, and But but I think you – and I've, I've brought this up before, talking about playing the ranked teams, talking particularly about Ole Miss. Like, I'm sure no coach would – say it they might think it but i don't think they say it. but you gotta expect that they're gonna mess up one of those games right and when you do it's not the end of the world not now yeah, not when you've got this built up it's, it's you just don't want to mess up multiple times <laughs> yeah it's, it's, percent. it's how do you how do you come back from it and you know how, how do you bury it okay one other topic with basketball and that's the news of naquan tomlin sure it's official the kansas state transfer is going to suit up for the university of memphis uh, he was there Tuesday night signing autographs, and he was taking pictures with the fans, and we know how talented this guy is. Do you expect him to be in action on Saturday against Vanderbilt? Where do you see him playing in the lineup? Does he start? Does he come off the bench? And are you concerned at all, Parth, about chemistry? Yeah, so first of all, I 100% expect him to play You know, Saturday Obviously, nothing's a guarantee, but based on Penny's comments, based on the conversations I've had, people behind the scenes, um, you know, they wanted him to play yesterday. But it was, you know, the confirmation of graduation from Kansas State that had not come in. There was one from Miner saying there was one grade that a professor had not entered in to make that final, you know, make his graduation status final. That was, per, you know, that was uh, stopping him from playing. Uh, because he's signed, he can practice with the team, he can be with the team, he can be on the bench. But as soon as that comes in, which they expect to happen today, I'm not sure if it's happened already or not, then it'll be clear to suit up in games. And, you know, I'm sure we'll see him Saturday. How much we'll see him? Probably, probably not a ton, if I had to guess. Probably off the bench, you know, maybe 10, 12 minutes, which is still a lot for a guy who's playing his first game midseason with this team. First of all, how do you get your diploma if the professors haven't signed off on your grades yet? How does that work? I have no idea. That that was kind of my understanding is like that was the one holdup, right? Like that one professor had to punch in a grade for that to become final. And then I guess send along the, it's called confirmation of graduation to Memphis, to the university of Memphis. Sometimes <laughs> the, the little fold over plasticky styrofoamy thing uh, is just that it's just a case. There's like nothing in between there. And then, and then, and then you get like the little piece of paper that goes between the Plastic styrofoam. Oh, you're, you're not joking. So you're, you're, saying, serious. you're being serious. Yeah. Yeah. What he's saying is, yeah, they, but again, they let him go through. They let, but they they let, let people go, go through, through the ceremony. No, that's If the professor nothing. turns around and puts an F up there and he doesn't complete the class and he just went through the whole motion, the well, whole th pop th and th circumstance. There's probably a, a, a large amount of confidence or a good a good chance that that grade will not be an F, right? right. If they so let him walk the stage so it down. <laughs> on it's December 9th. Or and whatever, what, what, just throw it down what there. professor, like, couldn't be These bothered unless he got knocked out with, like, killer COVID. What? Just put your grades in, Exactly. Dude. I mean, don't get me started as far as that's concerned. All right, so 
What do you expect to see? And Tim, do you do you see any? Right now, their chemistry is fantastic. He just hit me. Did you see that? That was just, just a, that was a, that was a, a little pat. <laughs> a little tap. Was. A little, little tap. Um, chemistry's been great. Do you foresee any chemistry issues with another big time player in the lineup? The only the only reason I passed chemistry ca- class was I had David Garza sitting next to me, who's now like a science professor in Georgia. Always you're going to go with me, Garza. You're asking me chemistry <laughs> issues. I learned two things in chemistry. Fire is hot and glass breaks. <laughs> that was it. Out. <laughs> Fire. Hot. Um, yeah. They, look, they, they they all talked about how he's an easygoing guy and it shouldn't be a problem or whatever. Um, they can kind of use him. So so when he's he's I don't think he's really gonna take away anybody's minutes to any great extent. Maybe um, Malcolm's a little bit right because Malcolm's in a starting role now, and I think. But will they play them Tom- together? Yeah, I think they could. They could absolutely yeah. could because yeah. Tomlin's so versatile; he could slot in at the three, four, or five. Yeah, I, I, to me, when you got a guy like that, he just brings in depth. He's not. He's not throwing anything off. You're. He's not going to step in for somebody who's, you know, an all conference player and take their job. Okay, and then going into the game on Saturday against Vanderbilt, I know that you had uh, reported. On Wednesday, I don't want to get my days mixed up today, Wednesday, right? that Jaquan Walton was in a walking boot after coming up a little lame last night in the yep. game against Virginia. What is his status? Yeah, so the guys were at Sherwood Sherwood Middle School. I believe I'm pronouncing that right. Um, Jaquan Walton and Javon Quinterly to, to chat with some middle schoolers um, and kind of hang out there. Yes, so, we do. Parth just gave the answer. <laughs> exactly. Siri's Siri, listening, isn't she? <laughs> yeah. So I went out there and, and talked to those guys, and I obviously noticed that Jaquan's in a, in a walking boot on on that, um, I believe it's the right foot. I'm trying to think. I believe it's the right foot. Not that it matters. But, you know, I asked him, you know, uh, how he feels, if he thinks he'll play on Saturday against Vanderbilt, and he he wasn't sure. He looked kind of like, I don't want to use the word dejected. It seems kind of strong, but he he looked concerned, man. Like, you know, he hasn't seen a doctor yet today and mm. he, he doesn't, he doesn't know what's going to happen, but he said, you know, um, I hope the fans know that if I can play, I'm, I'm, I'm going to play is, is what he said. I'm paraphrasing, but that was the message from, from Jaquan Walton. That was very snappy from Siri. She sounds moody. Yeah, today. What's up with Siri, but more <laughs> than likely, again, if there's a question, don't use them. This is a Vanderbilt team. Yes, they may be an sec team, but they are struggling. They lost another starter several days ago. <laughs> Who did they just lose to the other day? They lost to Western Carolina. Western last Carolina. Night. Again, you don't want to sleepwalk. You want to be out there giving your best effort every time. But Memphis should be able to win this one handily. Like you said, Tomlin should be in there. And crowd wise, Tim, it's Christmas on Monday. A lot of people are home for the holidays, seeing their family here in Memphis, three o'clock in the afternoon. Hopefully it'll be a nice crowd. Yeah. It won't be Clemson S, but it but it should be a good crowd. There's right. I mean it is. It's something to do a couple of days, you know, with the people who are in from out of town and um you know, as long as you got your shopping done, which I'm sure you do, Greg. No. I don't always, have mine done either, but I gotta catch a flight minute. to North Carolina. Always last minute. In well, four days. <laughs> speaking of that, I know you'll be uh heading out. Wanna wish you Merry Christmas and happy holidays. So you will not be with us next week. Next week's podcast will be strictly football as we get ready for the AutoZone Liberty Bowl game. But you'll be back with us the week after to yep. talk Tigers. We'll recap everything that's happened with Vanderbilt and in their game against Austin P on the 30th and then talk about what's ahead, which is all conference play. So thank you very much, Parth. Thank you. And, of course, we got uh, some football talk coming up with uh, Frank Bonner in just a moment. Frank Bonner now joins myself and Tim the Talk Tigers football. The Tigers now back to practice, gearing up for the AutoZone Liberty Bowl game, which will be coming up a week from this Friday. You're talking the 29th of December as they will take on Iowa State from the Big 12. But today, as we speak, Frank, we're right in the middle of the chaos that is the start of National Signing Period, the early National Signing Period. I also know today is National Signing Day. And names are still coming in, so nothing is complete. But so far, it looks like Memphis has done a heck of a job. And just from rivals, they have Memphis ranked number 14 in the entire country. That includes Power 5 schools as far as the transfer portal players. Yeah, I mean, if you look at this year and last year, Memphis has continued to hit big in the transfer portal, which is which is interesting to say for a school um, that we all know doesn't have 
the longest money in NIL. So right. to look at what they're able to do in the transfer portal, you gotta you gotta tip your hat off to utilizing their resources to the best of their ability. Tim, again, we're in the midst of it, but it seems like it's going well. And Frank's right on. That has always been an issue since NIL began several years ago for Memphis to be able to have that type of uh, financial situation to be able to compete with some of the teams, especially their peers. But it looks like they're doing a good job in being able to convince players to come and play for them. Yeah, they they know there's opportunity here. I mean, I think that's the biggest thing. And Blake Watson is probably, you know, at the forefront of a lot of the 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 sales pitches like look at look at what somebody can do and come in for one year and just like really elevate your your value and all that it's um it's it's just the way the games played nowadays it's it's all just so different than in the past but they've done a good job at it they're they're not quite old miss transfer portal esque right but Who is? Uh, oh man what Ole Miss has done is just unbelievable. The stories I've heard about the money they have available yeah. in the gr- Grove collection. They, yeah. Is that what it's called? The um, yeah, I might go to the Grove, the Grove with a, with a shovel and see what I can find oh, down there. My gosh. Bring one of those little things that you find the, the metals, metal, detector. metal detectors and, and find some money laying around. But the big name so far and the portal is Mario Anderson running back from South Carolina, who was the starting running back for the Gamecocks of the SEC this past season. And to Tim's point, Blake Watson, who came from a smaller school, came to Memphis because he knew he would get that opportunity and try to get his shot at the next level like many running backs that have come through Memphis have gotten. Well, that's what Mario Anderson has basically said. Now, certainly you had to have something at ILYs to bring him from South Carolina as there were other schools, big names, Frank, they were looking at Mario Anderson. How did they pull this one off? <laughs> yeah, right. I think it's a combination of, of of the two. For one, he's looking at Memphis in the first place because of the long history of running backs. And then Blake Watson most recently will be another NFL running back that we all presume. Um, and then there has to be – like these things don't happen in this day and age without some NIL dollars. So whatever – the amount of NIL that he feels he can get or whatever the case may be. We know that had to be a part of it um, after leaving a school like South Carolina. 5'9", 208-pound running back, averaged uh, over four yards per carry. I'm not sure exactly what the average was, but he had 700-plus yards. Yeah, but, he was 707. But he's somebody who came from a smaller school, uh, Newberry, to, to South, Carolina. South Carolina. So – uh, it's the skeptic in me, I suppose. I always wonder about the guys who come from a starting role at a whatever it is, an SEC program or a Power Five program, and then go down to a Group of Five program out of the portal. Was there, you know, uh, was there a clash with the position coach? Was there a, a you know a coaching change that that impacted things? Did they recruit behind them and somebody maybe was going to start ahead of them? Um, you always. Certainly wonder all about what's what's right. behind a move like that, but it's the guys who move up to me that that Kedrell Lewis um, started at San Jose State, comes from Louisiana Monroe, three year starter. You know, with what the needs are for the Tigers on the offensive line, you figure that's somebody that they got in mind to uh, to maybe plug in, and that to me is the kind of move that makes sense. Even though Tigers basketball history with some belt conference players from Louisiana Ow. isn't all that Ow, terrific right there. now. But as far as offensive linemen are concerned, I don't know if any of you guys got the list. Again, that list is, is growing as we speak. But they lost a lot with the offensive line. There's no question about that. But they seem to be filling it up. Now, whether or not these players are quality or just quantity, they needed to go out and get offensive linemen because – Four left, Frank. So they had to go and replace those offensive linemen. It looks like they've done a pretty good job in at least getting those numbers. Yeah, right. And that's where it starts, right? And obviously, and and Ryan Silverfield has said this, you know, in some cycles past that like every single player you bring in, everybody's not going to be a hit right away. But the hope is that enough of those guys are a hit in order to fill right. some holes that you have, right? So every single offensive lineman they're going to bring in is not going to be 
producing right away. But if one or two of those guys can 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 be a guy next year, then Memphis would be satisfied. They went out and they got some linemen, both offensive and defensive linemen, from the junior college ranks. And again, you're talking about this recruiting class. It's high school, it's JUCO, and of course it's the portal. But as far as the high school kids are concerned, uh, about 20 minutes ago, Frank and I were looking at the story about Keandre Henry. He had his presser. He rips open his shirt, and there's a Memphis Tigers shirt, and this guy is a four-star wide receiver. Yeah, and I don't think you can overstate how huge that is for Memphis to get. I mean, what the according to um, 247 Sports, it's the 11th uh, four-star recruit in, in Memphis history. Just the 11th, wow. I mean, that's not. That's not a lot. And so to to be able to pull that off in the same year that you get a guy like Mario Anderson from, from South Carolina, this recruiting cycle is looking pretty good for Memphis. I mean, to he this and this is an athlete who, who committed and decommitted twice to uh Boston College and Purdue, and then he he lands on Memphis. And so, I mean, kudos to that staff. Commitment issues. Well, I <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, who knows what all these guys are going to do? I mean, half of them will be gone in two years anyway. But don't be a Debbie Downer. No, I'm just a realist. But I, and look, the whole stars thing, I don't buy into that either. I, look, a guy's a three star and he commits to a, to a power five program and he magically becomes a four star. I'm not talking about the one that you guys were just talking about, but that whole star system's a little, uh, no, it, it is. Yeah, well, I, I bring it up just because it's whether that's an evaluation of talent. I do think the star rankings are an evaluation of how much they're sought after. Right. And so if you're a four star guy, you're a guy who, has options. Now, whether the talent, you know, if, if is going to pan out to where you're a four-star guy really or not or whatever, a four-star guy is a guy who can go to a number of different schools. Yes, but the talent has to match. I mean, again, it's not you, always – it doesn't always work out, as, as Tim was alluding to, but there's a reason why they got four stars or five stars or three stars next to them. It's evaluated by football people who yeah, know but to, the sport. To Tim's point, um, you know, you'll, you'll, get a, you'll get a three-star guy – who, when he gets to college, you realize he should have been a four or a five, and you'll get a four star. And so, like, right. I think that's right. What, is yeah. that the point you're making? Yeah, absolutely. Some yeah. some of these guys have no stars, and then they commit to somebody, and the uh, quote unquote experts go, "Oh, we better figure out how many stars to give them." Oh, they and, and miss. They, they rate them. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, like, like, it's like Vegas and the odds makers. Right. They miss but, every once in a while. Chandler Martin, a great story, came from a small school, and was. Yeah. Arguably the best defensive player Memphis had this past season. But as it pertains to to Memphis and, and, and Keandre Henry, if you have a four star tag to your name, colleges are looking at you, right? Top notch sure, colleges are sure. looking at you, and Memphis was able to beat out a a, 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 a person who was being recruited at a four star caliber level to come to their program. I think that's huge. Do you know what? By the way, do you know what Anderson was when he went to South Carolina? He went from a Small school, so I can't imagine they looked at him as like this five star guy, right? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think he was. But uh, USC, Oklahoma, Oklahoma, Cal, you know, some of the schools that were after this guy. So again, I give a lot of credit to Ryan Silverfield and that staff on the recruiting trails. They yeah. work their tails off. Will it pan out? We'll find out. Yeah. But they really work hard to get players, and hopefully, players that turn out to be good quality players to help the team win. Yeah, and to your question, I looked it up. Coming out of uh, Newberry, according to what I found on 247 Sports, he was a three-star. Okay. He probably got a promise, too. You are going to be our Blake Watson. Yes. That's why you pick a Memphis Without over a uh, those other schools where, you know. You're the fourth running back. At yeah, yeah, you're splitting carries or whatever. You know how there's always, like, a hidden gem? All right, here and I, look, I got no clue on any hey, of these Hey, this guys. is what we're here for. I got, I got one. I got one. Here's here's my guy, and not just because he's from Gordo High, Ethan Wilder. Gordo, that's in Alabama, isn't it? Yeah, it is in very. Gordo, I remember driving nice. through Gordo. Oh yeah. Tuscaloosa. Oh, I've yeah. I've passed Good through it a Gordo. bunch of times. He had he had a, like a four touchdown game and a five touchdown game. The the it, one of them was a playoff game. He had an eighty four yard kickoff return. He's a D back, uh, thirty eight yard pick six, uh, four touchdowns in the first half of the playoff game. Um, 
Then he had another one. Uh, he he, he uh, returned a kickoff for a touchdown off a lateral, a different game. He blocked the punt. Uh, and he blocked the punt and he ran in. He recovered the fumble and he ran it in for a touchdown. There's my there's my gem, Ethan Wilder. He's got good size. He's 5'11", 170. You wonder, was he... What, what, did Alabama even give him a sniff? Did they look at him? I mean, the his other credential? his other offers were Arkansas State in February, and Shorter back in May. I had to look it up. Shorter is a wow. real program. Where do you think the need is outside of offensive linemen, which we've been talking about? And again, recruiting is going to be done. They're announcing their their recruit recruitments later today. As far as the complete class, I guess they could add still because it's not just today. But where do you think the need was the most for Memphis? Well, I have to go through and, and look at who who they brought in. But I do think that defensive back is another one yes. that you want to look at, right? You you bring in a guy like Simeon Blair. Now he's he's gone. Um, I do know Davion Ross, who didn't play. You expect him to still be in a program and be healthy. But defensive back is a, is a position that maybe not a lot of people are talking about that I'm curious to see how they plug uh, some of those holes. They also yeah. got a kicker from Ole Miss. They got Cade Costa, who was in a battle with the other guy that ended up beating him out. But I, I was talking to some people who uh, cover Ole Miss. They said the guy's got a huge leg. Gillis did a great job for Memphis this year, but they were lacking in touchbacks because the Vandenberg got hurt and he wasn't the same. Yeah. The whole, this kid Costa supposedly has a big leg. So that's – especially when you're – Memphis and schools of, of that size as opposed to maybe the Ohio States, even though all schools need a good kicker and a punter. But you need to make an emphasis on kicking, punting, and special teams because sometimes that'll win you a game. Yeah, absolutely. Also, um, quarterback, your backup quarterback, I think, with, with Tevin Carter leaving, obviously you know who your starter is in Seth. Um, but the backup quarterback is an important position. You got to be – you want to feel – confident in your backup quarterback. So I think that's another position that Memphis has to figure out who's that who's that gonna be. All right. Did they get any quarterbacks today yet? You know by chance when I see that when I list? left the house, their their quarterback commit, Arrington Maiden, at the time had not uh been announced as an official signee, but it might be while I was driving. And, and also then, go ahead. Oh Jordan he, Bell, who played quarterback, is coming as an athlete. Yeah. So we'll see where he ends up. Right. But Usually, um, when they put athlete on, it means they're going to make a position change right. and play something other than what they were in high school. Exactly. Or might they haven't figured out yet whether he's going to be a receiver or a DB or yeah. or something along those lines. There's also this kid, Mark Thompson, who says he's deciding between Houston and Memphis. Did you say he was he played some quarterback? Uh, if you look at his Twitter, his pin tweet, it says qu- quarterback. Uh, yeah, quarterback halfback. halfback, and so so, so an offensive skill position player. But usually, if you if you're recruiting somebody to be your your number two at quarterback, um, you're probably looking at somebody who who played quarterback as their sole position. Exactly. Yeah. I really think this is the conversation that recruiting recruiting coordinators throughout the country have. You know, pretty much year round. If you look at his Twitter, he's a let's go after this guy. <laughs> <laughs> but what about Frank? What about? And I'm not sure how much you know of their capability, but guys that are on the team currently that play quarterback that were behind Tevin Carter. Is there anybody ready to step up and become that second uh, second string quarterback? I don't know because you, if you remember when leading into the game that we didn't know if Seth was going to play, uh, and the question was asked if. Tevin Carter is your starter, who's the backup, right? And they didn't really have an answer, which yes. to me that means that they weren't really all that confident in knowing who would be a number three guy. Like that, that didn't seem to your question about who's already on the roster. Th- that situation doesn't seem promising in terms of who they believe could be a strong number two. Yeah, when that question was being asked about who would be Tevin's number two if Seth didn't play, that's a good point. What was that? The Charlotte game, I think. Yeah, where it was he mm-hmm. was questionable. Okay. So Ryan Silverfield's meeting the media later today. So maybe we'll get an answer or two. But what would be your presumption as who will coach the defense as the interim DC for the game since Matt Barnes has left to go to Mississippi State? I'm landing on so Charles Clark is a guy who has been in the program 
the longest. Uh, him him and Pope have been in the program the longest under under Silverfield, right? And so he's a guy, he's a name that I would throw out there. Maybe um Hankins, just because I mean those line that that linebacker group has been solid under him. I mean, one of those two guys, I would I would those are the two names that I would throw out there as, as possible interim. Now, Clark and um defense line coach. Uh Kyle, yeah, Pope. And Pope. Uh, Hankins as well, but these guys are one day they're going to get their shot as defensive coordinator. But I want to ask you, Tim, with a team that struggled defensively, would it be a mistake to hire from within, elevate somebody to the, to the D.C. position, or do you start over again and bring in somebody from the outside? Yeah, you bring in somebody from the outside, somebody uh, who maybe you have some familiarity with or some prior ties to the program who maybe worked with you know Silverfield when Silverfield was an assistant and the guy went off somewhere else uh, that kind of thing it's um, I'd be surprised to see the promotion from within because of what you said the the struggles and that's what you that's what you need to improve and I may add uh, while we're talking there Arrington Maiden and I think he's the guy that got pegged as their quarterback of the future uh, kid out of Texas, out of College Station. Wow. Um, yeah, indeed, it's signed uh, about half an hour ago. So there you go. So again, we can throw his name out there now, now that he's, he's signed. Oh, he's we, probably, we could have thrown it out well, before. But, but again, but, what's uh, interesting is here's a kid guy. they yeah. take right out of Texas A&M's hands. But Texas A&M obviously wasn't going after the no, guy. Because no, if they wanted to, they no. would have gotten the guy. So I wonder how good he is. But a guy who may be not good enough, at least on paper for – Texas A and M and is from Memphis doesn't mean that that kid, that kid won't be uh, in the future a really good quarterback and that goes back to Tim's original point you just you never know again Ryan Silverman if, if Texas A and M and schools like that knew that Ron, that uh, Seth Hennigan would be the quarterback he has been at Memphis where he's going to rewrite all the records they would have recruited him well um, when I was work when I was talking to his father for a story I did a while back um, some of them have have. Told his father, yeah, we were we were wrong about Seth. Oh yeah, it happens. Like, it happens yeah, all the time. Like, and so, you know, to your point, it, that that's a valid point. But I can't, I can't get you on a podcast on, on on recruiting day and not give some love to to one of the local athletes that are being signed. Kavion Benton is one of them. Um, I don't think he's going to necessarily be like a true freshman who's going to get a lot of playing time. But he's a guy that that uh, when I talked to him, he said that. Um, He's most likely going to be used as 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 an edge guy, and so he's somebody two three years from now whose name might pop up on some depth charts. Here's here's the other thing with um, you know, you mentioned like a Hennigan or whatever, or guys who the bigger schools miss on. They might play in a college town. They might be able to see the the stadium from their bedroom window, and they <laughs> right. It's so, people don't understand. I think like just how complicated it is because you got to have your counters. You you know your they're on this class. Are they are they on your 105 roster? Um, and then they each class is divvied up like a whatever. Take a school, a Texas A&M. They might have their their quarterback room already locked up, uh, and they don't have a spot in the current recruiting class for a quarterback. Good and point. There might be one of the the best quarterbacks in the country that's right down the road from your own stadium, but you just don't have room for them in your class. Memphis also gets a defensive lineman from Indiana, so there's a Big Ten D lineman that will transfer. That's Patrick Lucas. They've announced that. PJ. Also, they get a punter from UTEP, Joshua Sloan, who is committed. And you were talking about the the local players, and I'm trying to make sure I get his name correctly. I had it a second ago. But they got the uh, linebacker from Arkansas State who played at Whitehaven High School, who was good for Arkansas State, one of their top tacklers. And they got him, so he has transferred for a final year. Um, I know Tim is feverishly trying to find that name for us. Uh, who was uh, – here it is, Javante Mackey. Javante Mackey could be a real nice addition, a veteran linebacker who played in the Sun Belt Conference. And Memphis has has hit on transfer linebackers yes. as, of, as of lately, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, transfer linebackers and transfer running backs, they've been doing all right these last couple of years. All right, so next week – Practice has already begun for the Tigers, but next week all the events leading up to the game will take place and you'll be busy running around. Uh, and next week, you and I, in depth, will talk about 
the AutoZone Liberty Bowl matchup with Iowa State for next week's podcast. But my one concern going in, and I know people like to say it's a glorified exhibition. Hey, Memphis wants to win this game bad, and Iowa State doesn't want to lose to a group of five school. And we know what happened six years ago when they met here in Memphis, 21-20. to Tigers almost pulled it out. So this is one of those games where I think actually both teams are into it and want to play well. But with all the defections in the offensive line, who do the Tigers have to pick up for the guys that left to make sure – Seth Hennigan's not a sitting duck in this, again, so-called exhibition game. I mean, you still got. I mean, it's gonna be, it's gonna be, it's gonna be rough. There, it's slim pickings, right? But you know, Terrence McLean uh, uh, had, had got some, some, some time. I mean, there is he going to play? I thought he hit the portal already. McLean, is he still with him? Uh, I could be wrong about that. I have to double check. I haven't I haven't seen anything, but I could be wrong. Um, I thought somebody told me McLean. Uh, we know Jacob likes, but Jacob likes is expected to play, right? From his tweet to me, right when he said "see you on the 29th. December 29th, that says to me that he plans on being on the field on December twenty ninth. Right, because he didn't hit the portal. He's just going to opt for the NFL right. draft. But the other part, and I haven't dived into this yet on on the other end of uh, Iowa State, but I. I Talk with Seth Hennigan about this. He said that because I asked him about like game planning for Iowa State's defense, and he said the other part of that is, you know, there are guys on that end that are going to be opting out and 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 transferring or whatever. And so uh, Memphis is obviously not going to be at full strength of what they were during the season, but I don't expect Iowa State to necessarily be at full strength right. from what they Nobody were during the season. So the it's gonna it's gonna be both ways in terms of of what you're dealing with. Do you expect? More opt outs after the game for Memphis. Yes, I do, and I don't. I haven't, I haven't been told that or anything, but the nature of of college football, of course, you expect. I mean, you ask me that about any team in the in the country, I'm going to tell you, yeah, because that's just what happens, right? Some guys wait because they want to play in the bowl game and they need the film before they go in the portal. I mean, there's a lot of right. different reasons why guys right. choose to wait until after the bowl game. Would you agree with that, Tim? Yeah, some of them are December grads and. Um, it's there's there's all sorts of factors. McLean, to answer your question, he was the one who quote unquote declared for the draft, even though he'd only started That's like three games was. or uh, so he declared for the draft. Didn't like go in the that. portal, so I guess there's yeah. a possibility he could play, right? Yeah. Um that's what it was. I mean it's it's the same situation as as likes as likes. And so and again, we'll find out more when, when Ryan addresses the media, which is later today. I'll give Tim the final word since he won't be with us next week. Your thoughts on Memphis playing Iowa State, getting a chance to play a Power 5 school in the AutoZone Liberty Bowl game. Just how important is it? And then I want to also have you comment on what happened with the city council as far as the stadium issue is concerned. So a lot for Tim here to wrap it up. You gave me the final word, and then you asked me for like five different questions I want a bunch to of answer words. there. A bunch of words. Um, yeah, I mean the, – the, you, you, you want to end the season on the right note, so that's that's what the the Liberty Bowl is all about. Um, you know, you can argue it's a shame for some of those kids that after what they did all season, they don't get to travel somewhere different. But the case, you know, can be made that there's positives to having them playing the Liberty Bowl as well. Right. The stadium. Um, eh, look, there's there's still. I mean, yes, it got passed, and 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 the ownership is, or or whatever phrase you want to use to describe the control of it is going to going to transfer over because of the the city council vote um but there was i mean there was last minute haggling on that there was unhappy people on that it uh it took way longer and and apparently was way more complicated i think than a lot of people thought it was going to be rubber stamps so and that certainly did not happen um but you know people got together they they Thought outside the box a little bit. They they came up with some solutions, and um, it sounds like they made a next a nice next step in the process. I think now the Memphis Tigers fully expect to to proceed with all their plans right. and everything. Right. But there's still you know some minor haggling uh, going on behind the scenes. What we do know is walls won't be tumbling down come the day after or a week after the Autos and Liberty Bowl because the next council meeting is not even until January 9th. So that will delay the start of the uh, construction on the Autos, on the uh, Simmons Bank Liberty Stadium. 
I should say, Simmons Bank Liberty Stadium with the renovations. Tim, Merry Christmas to you. Same to you, Greg. And we'll talk to you, I guess, after the uh, 1st of January. Sounds good. All right. And Frank, thank you so much. And we look forward to having you uh, with uh, with us next week as we talk all things Tigers football leading up to the AutoZone Liberty Bowl game. Merry Christmas to you and your family. Uh, you as well. Thank you so much. That'll do it for us for this week. Be sure to check out our other podcasts, the Daily Memphians Food Podcast, Sound Bites. It's hosted by Chris Harrington and Holly Whitfield. The Sidebar with Eric Barnes is about arts, culture, and everything in between. And the Grizzlies podcast is also hosted by Chris Harrington with Drew Hill. All of our podcasts are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find podcasts. Merry Christmas. Happy Holidays. We'll talk to you next time.